Morgan Stanton here, ASAP Frontline in beautiful Las Vegas, Nevada, in the Delano, in the Mandalay Bay. And now it is um, Saturday, 4.30 p.m. And um, now we've, we've talked to Dr. Rebecca Parker before, and but now she is Madam President of the American College of, the, of Emergency Physicians. And so I um, want to be the hopefully the first interview here to really get into it and talk to you about um, everything to expect over uh, over the next year. Dr. Parker, thanks for joining me once again. Thanks for having me. All right, so you came out, I think, one thing, and we were, tw- we were tweeting about it during the, uh, uh, during the council today, during your speech. It seemed like you're coming out swinging. And it, was a, it was a very, um, let's get ready to, to you know, tighten our belts, pull our boots up, and get ready to fight some of the battles that lead ahead of us. What do you see as the challenges we're going to face as a college and what to expect over the next year? Well, we do have a pretty broad and well-defined strategic plan, but there are a couple things I'll focus on. The first thing I talked about the council is our fair coverage balance billing fight that's been going on for just over a year really intensely. Uh, That has to do with our ability to get paid fairly by the insurance industry uh, for the services that we provide, but it's also about the coverage that our patients receive. And so the important part here is unity and for us to come together and also to come together with other specialty organizations to be ready to fight this battle, which is really state by state. What we're seeing is the insurance companies have a organized effort to ban our ability to balance bill at the state level and are introducing legislation to that effect. And then telling legislators that we are the bad guys in this and providing surprise bills. And what we found this last year as we dug into it further was actually these bills were surprised because of the deductibles that the patients had and they didn't realize in their high co-pays. So it wasn't actually the bad billing of physicians, it was actually the poor coverage by the insurance industry. And that's, and I, I don't know that in many of our physicians out there realize how much of an issue that, that it could be. And I think one of the things we fall into um, in medicine, especially emergency medicine, but actually medicine in general, is that we tend to react instead of being proactive when it comes to these, these battles. In terms of a physician out there, no matter where they may be, how do they get prepared for it whenever something happens in their state? Or how do we head this off knowing that it will ripple across the states? Everybody's, every one of these companies is going to test the waters in every state to see how much they can get away with in terms of deflecting the negativity that comes with the insurance companies now and also um, nickel and diming away from the physicians and the nurse practitioners and the PAs and folks that are on the ground providing the care. Well, the first thing is to realize that it's a multi-pronged strategy. See, the insurance companies are raising deductibles, narrowing their networks, uh, using our EMTALA obligation to send patients to us, and then shifting the cost to the patients uh, while then saying that we are the ones that are doing predatory billing. So you need to realize that first. The second thing is to turn to your state chapters as these, these bills come forward. We have resources for them. We have built PR campaigns. Our faircoverage.org campaign is a good place to start to educate yourself. Uh, and the national organization has resources for those state chapters. The third thing is I would tell you to pay attention to your patients and their stories. I know when I was working a few weeks ago, I had a patient that came in very sick, a young woman that had no medical problems that came in, I almost had to intubate her. And as I talked to her about why she waited to come in, it was because of the insurance company's coverage. She was scared to come in because of a high deductible, high co-pays, and she couldn't afford it, frankly. So gather those stories, ask your patients when they come in and you see them delaying care, why why that's happening, and be ready then to take that to your state legislatures so you can tell the truth of what's going on, which is really the insurance company bad behavior that's out there. And that's absolutely it, telling the stories and hitting it home that these folks are delaying care, or even what I'm seeing, like the patient I had last week who was uh, status post hysterectomy and was having a increasing abdominal pain and fatigue and weakness and uh, bloating, and so we assume something's going on in there postoperatively. 
and the insurance company refused to allow them, the surgeon, to do a CT scan. So the patient had to be sent to the emergency room um, to get that checked out. And and it will be. Um, it will be a an increased cost to the patient, to the system in general. And also, um, what we're finding now, um, what we've been having is if I don't find anything significantly wrong and I send the patient home, then they say they didn't need it. And then they then they uh, somehow decide not to cover it, not pay the hospital, or or cut the uh, payment to the physician because of it. Um, so also, big thing we talked about, and we actually talked about this when we were in um, when we were in Washington D.C. We talked about diversity, and that is a huge huge drive, and a lot of statistics. I mean, even doing the survey during the council, um, clear disparities, and I liked what you said in your speech that. Um, our body doesn't nece- doesn't reflect our patients that we're seeing. So how do we cross that bridge into um, into all comers? Because it is it is becoming more diverse within the house of medicine. My medical school class was the first that was 50/50 in our school. Um, and, um, it, and then so the medical schools have made it there. How do we draw more of that to emergency medicine in our practice? Well, it is a really important issue and, and an important initiative. You know, our patients are diversifying more and more. By 2044, the minority population will be the majority. In some places like Chicago, they, they already are the majority of the population. And then as you look at the pipeline uh, from medical schools, it has been increasing uh, over the years in terms of diversity. And the AAMC, the Association of American Medical Colleges, it is purposely focusing on diversi- diversifying that pipeline. So we need to take a look at ourselves as a specialty and take a look at also the care we deliver and uh, think about the barriers that we have to people entering and coming to emergency medicine and also the leadership piece of our specialty. Uh, We've done two things that are very directive and intentional uh, that is coming out in the next couple months. One is that we wrote a position paper editorial for Annals of Emergency Medicine, which has been tentatively accepted. It needs some edits, but they do want to publish it. And it describes why ASEP should go into uh, this this mission and why we should take this journey. Uh, and then the second thing was we have a task force headed by Dr. Leifridge, Um, out of Washington, D.C., and with Dr. Steve Anderson as the board liaison. And they have started their work to come together with tactics on how to approach this topic. Um, They have three work groups looking at engagement of physicians was number one. Number two is uh, what are the barriers to professional development and how to break down those barriers. And then number three is to look at health disparities and spreading that information. Um, So it's really an exciting time. We have many leaders that have come out of the woodwork excited about this journey, willing to step up and and help have some of these conversations. Um, The other thing that I've done is put some different objectives throughout our committees to to look at different aspects of those barriers. I'll give you a couple examples. I've asked the Ethics Committee to look at the concept of um, implicit bias, in other words, um, unconscious bias, and how does that affect how we interact with each other professionally, how does it affect us to be able to practice, and then also the care that we deliver at the bedside. Um, I looked at to having a session on that at Leadership and Advocacy Conference during our Leadership Day. Uh, so uh, we have a lot of friends that will join us in this journey, and, and I'm excited. I think emergency physicians are a great set of physicians to take this on. We take all comers, all ages, all types of people. And as physicians, we picked that profession. We believe in that mission. And so I think as we come together and explore this topic, that we'll, we'll find some tangible solutions to improve these, these things and prepare ourselves for the future. Where do you think the challenges lie in the practice of emergency medicine attracting um, minority uh, physicians and as, as well as, as females? Because it does seem that we are seeing some shift, we're seeing some efforts, especially when it comes to females going into our residency programs. But there's still a very significant disparage when it comes uh, disparity when it comes to minorities uh, going into emergency medicine. Why are we having the uh, the challenge of attracting folks to choose emergency medicine? Well, when it comes to women, we actually do have some work we need to do. So if you look at medical school graduates, uh, about half have been women for about 15 years now, and we are only at 38% of our residents being women. And that's been for the last three to four years based on the AAMC data. 
And sometimes surgery beats us out and ENT beats us out. And we tend to think of ourselves as sort of being a place that everyone will want to practice. So we'll need to, you know, dig in further as to those reasons, whether it's some of the work-life balance issues, if it's some of the uh, the style differences in emergency medicine, um, are there biases on either side? And, and I think that's part of the work that needs to be done. Uh, when it comes to minorities and uh, in particular underrepresented minorities, which are sort of uh, um, African-American along with uh, Pacific Islander, American Indian, et cetera, um, we, the medical school population is uh, not that pipeline needs to build at the medical school level before we can grab those people into emergency medicine. So that pipeline actually starts even earlier, like in college or in high school. Um, we actually have some members that are looking at this right now. One of uh, our residents out of UIC is doing a pilot program she wants to do to encourage um, Hispanic and African American people to go into medicine starting at that you know high school college uh, entry. And I will give kudos to emergency medicine in terms of our African-American female faculty. We rank in the top 10 when you look at the AAMC data. So uh, we have been successful in that compared to other specialties. Um, so I think part of it's gonna, gonna be asking, asking the people that are with us now why they chose emergency medicine, asking people why they didn't choose emergency medicine, listening to the stories, um, because that's an important way to figure out what we need to do to break down those barriers. Um, our task force is terrific. We have over 20 members that have volunteered their time. Uh, many are experts in this. Others are really change agents within emergency medicine. And I'm excited to see the tactics they come up with for the future. So what are uh, what are some of the other big things that we can expect to uh, see or hear from um, this through the next year? So a couple things I would highlight. One is that we do need to be ready to implement MACRA, which is the Medicare Ac Access and Chip Reauthorization Act. And we just got the final rule, actually, either yesterday or the day before. Um, and ASAP has two projects it's working on related to MACRA. So first of all, MACRA is the redesign by how Medicare pays physicians. Uh, we have two projects to, to help physicians meet the MACRA requirements. One is our clinical data registry, CEDAR. Uh, and the second one um, is to propose an alternative payment models to be considered by for, for emergency medicine by CMS. So those two projects will continue. And the registry adds uh, extra opportunities for us to develop our own quality measures, to develop our own database, which could also allow us to develop research topics to uh, keep on top of the quality we're providing and also potentially research projects on how we can improve the care we deliver. Um, the other thing that I think is going to be a hot topic is really the opioid crisis. And ASAP's been heavily involved in testifying at the White House and to Congress about the issue of the opioid crisis. And I think we've done a good job of balancing the emergency medicine story, which is that we don't prescribe the long-acting uh, agents, uh, but we do see the entire story and, and what's going on in the opioid crisis. You know, we see the people that are dying, we see the, the people that can't get treatment, um, and we see the, the challenges we have to, to treat pain in an appropriate way. So typical of emergency physicians, we have lots of members with different ideas and options. We have people uh, experimenting on alternative ways to treat pain. Uh, we have chapters working on what they're calling warm handoffs between the emergency department and state agencies to get uh, people that you discharge from the emergency department immediately handed off to a sponsor to get them into treatment programs. So I think those kinds of things are going to be paramount for us to be able to help these patients that we see uh, that are, are suffering from the opioid crisis. The third thing I would highlight uh, is really uh, focuses uh, around the psychiatric borders and the psychiatric, psychiatric patient issue. We actually have a press conference on Monday where we're going to release a survey we recently did of our members and uh, have two of our researchers there as well to talk about their papers about psychiatric holders and not only that how much we're how much all of our members are seeing it, but then also uh, the data that shows that the quality of care is really suffers for those patients. And then it, of course, takes away from the rest of the department. So I think that's going to be another piece of the puzzle. And frankly, it ties into the opioid crisis. Um, you know, a lot of those patients are dual diagnosis patients where they have, you know, both depression and substance use disorders. Um, so but I think those will be things that will uh, hit our radar very quickly. Um, uh, probably the last thing I would highlight is a presidential election that's coming up. No matter your politics, uh, there's going to be a new president. So I will be ready to go out to Washington, D.C. and work with our D.C. office to meet with the new administration. 
Uh, with new administration comes new administrators in Medicare and CMS, HHS, uh, et cetera, and, and I'll, we'll need to go educate them about emergency medicine, about our issues, and be sure that we form those relationships early on. So that will happen soon after the election is completed in November. And this will be a very important year um, for with politics, because either way, no matter um, which party is in office, unless we get a really big curveball of somebody third party coming out of the woodwork, we are talking about a significant change, both with strong opinions about health care. And so um, next year, it will be very important not only for us to be active within the states, um, but on the national level. But uh, also remember, leadership and advocacy this year is early. Um, so you need to go ahead and put that on your calendar. You probably got something in the mail recently like I did. Um, so you want to make sure you need to be involved with that because we will need to be at that table early in order to drive it. Because as you know, um, everybody is aware out there, everybody, uh, at, folks throughout um, the House of Medicine, not just the House of Medicine, but around the, that affect medicine, love to put um, emergency medicine in the spotlight as, as the as the bad guy, the one to blame when in fact... We are the hub and where pe patients are being turned to and uh, need to go on a more and more frequent basis. Um, someone to be there 24-7, 365. And you actually also, those uh, two of the points you had, the middle two, was a huge focus in the council. The opioids, several different things in terms of the opioids. And also with the psychiatric boarding, the psychiatric issues, a lot of these things are challenges we're facing on the back end of medicine, the back door of medicine, getting our patients from the department. We see them, we evaluate them, we stabilize them from a medical standpoint. Now we need to get them somewhere else. What are the challenges we're going to see coming up um, that we're going to face um, that we're addressing with the council in terms of that back end process of the hospital, the emergency room with psych, behavioral health and recovery resources? So, yeah, so those all, all combined together show how our system is really broken in terms of uh, especially outpatient services. So I would say as we look towards solutions, we also need to keep our eye on the prize, which is as we have a chance to do practice redesign through the macro law I was talking about. So how can we be creative as emergency physicians are great at being creative and look at solutions that are a little bit outside the box? Um, how can we use things like telemedicine to help with those patients? Can we use, you know, I think about the telestroke program in my hospital that the hospitals bought the equipment, it's sitting there. Could I use that for telepsych like a lot of people are? Um, can I use that for that warm handoff conversation? You know, I think there's a lot of possibilities that come with technology, a lot of possibilities as we look to uh, do sort of a care coordination in terms of using case management and other resources to help us to be able to take back control of our environment and, and deliver the best care to those patients. Yeah, and it's going to be a lot of lot of work to be done because it, the wave is still coming in when it comes to um, to addiction, especially the opioid based addiction. So, a couple of challenges for you out there in the world of emergency medicine. Um, get more information. Faircoverage.org. I got that right, correct? You did. All right. <laughs> um, at least I got a ten minute memory left in Vegas. And as well as ASEP.org, you can find a whole lot of resources there. Remembering leadership and advocacy is coming up early uh, this year. And um, also, uh, we're looking forward now over the next year. Next, we are going to be hitting up Washington, D.C. at the end of October, beginning of November. So we have a lot of opportunities to be involved. Yes, I encourage people to come out to the LAC meeting, which is March 12th through the 15th. I encourage you, I know it's some spring break for some folks, bring your kids, show them Washington, D.C., and come and join uh, the conversation because we'll need your, your help there. And I'd also like to put a plug in for our wellness week coming up uh, in the wintertime. We're also... We're also doing a summit with some of the other organized medicine organizations to look at resiliency. And I think that all these things play into our wellness and our resiliency uh, as physicians so that we can get back to the bedside and get back to the joy of practicing medicine. And we do have several talks. I'm, I'm doing one of them on wellness, on burnout, wellness, empathy, and those sorts of things here at ASAP 16. So by the time this is released, we will be back in our hometown so if you missed those um, you know you can catch up on uh, virtual asap 
as well as some of the other sources for getting that information because wellness and that is one thing I, I didn't mention wellness was a huge focus during the council this year and I think it's become a larger focus during the national conference but also in emergency medicine in general if you're not on the uh, M Docs, EM Docs on uh, Facebook. That's a great one to get involved with because um, it's a great way for us to share stories and encourage each other from a position standpoint. It's a closed group, so you don't have any trolls out there taking advantage of having a bunch of positions in one place. Um, and uh, it's, it's a great way for us all to connect and understand we are all in a similar boat, um, seeing similar things and facing similar struggles. As for me, you can contact me at youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com. That's youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com. Uh, Dr. Parker, thank you very much. Thank you. My pleasure and my honor to represent the specialty this year as president. And I will catch you next time for ASAP Frontline.